When it comes to virtualization in Windows, it's always a bit of a dice roll when it comes to using VirtualBox. I, I made a prior video saying, hey, use Linux and QMU to get really good performance for free, but a lot of people don't want to use that solution, so they prefer VirtualBox. And I'm just here to tell you, VirtualBox isn't very good or not very performant. And if you're going to use Windows to virtualize, uh, you could either use VMware, which I'm not going to go over today, but it's a pretty expensive product. It's a very good and the market leader when it comes to virtualization. But we could actually use Hyper-V built into Windows Pro and above. So if you have that Pro license and above, just use Hyper-V. It's, it's there. It's free. It's going to be a lot faster than the VirtualBox uh, counterpart. And just to kind of showcase this before we get going, uh, I have like a little Ubuntu already optimized virtual machine. I'll, I'll go into how to make this, and we may even make an, our own virtual machine today. So we'll just hit start to this, and you'll get to see kind of the startup uh, video optimizations I've made, uh, and also all kinds of different... Uh, hurdles you need to overcome in Hyper-V. The, the nice thing about VirtualBox is they make it super easy. It has guest tools, all these things built in. Uh, but this right here is just a lot better because it's a type one hypervisor that runs on bare metal, where VirtualBox is a type two and it runs above the operating system and it just can never achieve the performance of a type one. However, I will say by default, uh, when you pop up in like Ubuntu, this is super, super laggy. Like if you go to YouTube and let's just type in YouTube, you can see it's not the best thing in the world, but at the same time, it's it's a virtual machine and you really wouldn't know it unless I pointed that out. Uh, so pretty cool. I'm going to go ahead and close this out and just kind of show you the performance here and we'll go ahead, launch our terminal. And I think I need to install NeoFetch. And you'll see this is kind of what we're running on. It's a Hyper-V UEFI release. This is a Gen 2 machine, which we're all going to get into here in a second. But it's very, very fast. And we can do a lot of things like just check out the shutdown times and, and power up times. Very good. Let's get into how you would go about setting this up in your system. First off, installing the requirements. Now, you could go through it manually with just an app whiz.cpl add Windows features, and then just enable Hyper-V, and then also I think it's Microsoft Hypervisor or Windows Hypervisor platform, these things right here. Now, if you don't wanna do that, I made a little cheat sheet, of course, so we're gonna do a lot of scripting today just to make this a lot easier on folks. And we'll just go into our terminal, right click, enter. I always get questions about my toolbox. Is it capable of Windows 11? Windows 11 and 10 are pretty much the same thing. And uh, there's very, it works on both. And just click enable Hyper-V and WSL right here. This basically grabs all of Hyper-V, installs all the, the optional components you need. There's about six or seven that you need. It also grabs WSL because if you're doing this type of thing, you probably want WSL. A little known fact about this as it installs here is Hyper-V is actually being sunset in 2029. So that is actually, you've got seven more years before Hyper-V is no longer there. Probably Windows 12, whenever it comes out, won't have Hyper-V. Uh, and they've basically been trying to push everyone to WSL, which WSL is fine for some stuff, but sometimes you just need to have that full-blown Linux operating system virtualized and Hyper-V does a good job of that. That'll enable everything you need for both WSL and Hyper-V. It's pretty much the one-click virtualization option for Windows. We'll close out of it. You'll launch into Hyper-V Manager. Uh, you can do that through your start menu. Just click Hyper-V Manager. Um, the first optimization you may notice, search indexing is turned off. What I'd recommend doing is coming into settings in Hyper-V. This is how I'd set it up for, let's like, say, a business or something. I usually would change the default store of all my VM files to a dedicated drive like I've done here. Uh, preferably solid state. Mine's not, though. It's old spinning platter, so it's a little slower than it probably should be. I usually turn off all enhanced session modes. Uh, enhanced session mode, typically, I, I've never got it into work quite right. Uh, at least I don't really like to put a lot of Windows stuff on Hyper-V, which Hyper-V is optimized for Windows. So I don't even bother with a lot of the enhanced session mode. Take note of your mouse release, control alt left arrow, kind of gets you out if you're in full screen mode and you're stuck. 
And that's about it for these generic settings. Next up, we set up our internet or our virtual switch here. Uh, you won't see external, you'll usually just have internal or private, uh, or you'll have this default switch, you just go new, external, create virtual switch, and then select your adapter. I'm using a 10 gig adapter here today. You hit okay, and uh, you'd be good. So once you have your default external switch in, you're good to go for the default settings. Now we can click new and virtual machine, uh, or you can come over here, right click new virtual machine, either or. You name it, let's uh, let's install Manjaro today. I already have an Ubuntu instance, don't need it. Uh, you typically, I always recommend Gen 2. If you do Generation 1, you, do, you miss out on a lot of optimization they made with PowerShell, uh, and you're gonna need that to set like resolution, or maybe you want to do uh, splitting of your GPU. Uh, I think Craft Computing made a really cool video where he took one GPU and split it to two, two different VMs, but you could actually split it to four VMs if you wanted to have everything working off of one GPU. So we're gonna do Gen 2. Memory assignment, you never want dynamic memory. I find more problems than it solves, and we're gonna want about 10 gigs of memory for this machine. We're gonna select that external connection we created earlier. We'll make our uh, machine, we'll make 128. Uh, note, if you put like a thousand or a terabyte in here, it, it won't take a full terabyte. This is all dynamic, dynamically allocated, so it'll only take what you need. Moving past that, uh, we'll select our ISO boot image. And I think I put that in downloads. I got a KDE version we'll install today. So we're gonna do Gen 2, we'll click Finish. That'll create that. Before it turns on, we're gonna make some setting changes. First up, take off secure boot. That's a, <laughs> that's a big one. Uh, kind of flip through here. Processor mode. Uh, this actually is set by default. I've, I've watched a couple YouTube videos and a lot of YouTubers miss this specific thing. You'll see this error message saying, hey, uh, whatever you change in here is not even gonna matter. And they, then they change it and hit apply and say that does something they're still probably working off of one virtual processor because the scheduling of the CPU, the CPU scheduler, is it's assigned to something called root. And basically with this, you can assign your CPU to however virtual processors you want or how many threads you want to use. Uh, my little script goes ahead and changes that to a classic scheduler. And that classic scheduler took out that warning. By clicking that virtualization button, it switches to classic. Uh, so just know that that happened. If you want to see that change, it is actually down here. Let me go to virtualization, and you'll see me change the scheduler type to classic mode right here using a BCD edit. This actually does an edit to the bootloader of Windows to change it to classic mode. This also enables us to do legacy and a lot of other cool hyper, hypervisor options. Now, uh, if you do have problems with like WSL or something, chances are you might need to change this back to root. Uh, just type root like that, and then just type that command into an elevated PowerShell or, or uh, command prompt and you'd be fine. So we're gonna leave that at classic though. I just wanted to show you that's that change. That button did it all for you, so you shouldn't run into any errors here. Uh, so let's keep moving through here. Integration services. You don't really need any of this. Uh, I'll go ahead, take off backup uh, checkpoints. I like to disable checkpoints. You can leave them in if you like, uh, but it doesn't really matter too much. Uh, automatic start option. I'm not gonna have this start automatically. And then automatic stop options just to save it at its current state. So with that, let's hit connect and see if we can install this. Now, by default, this will be a little bit wonky. Uh, because it, it's going to probably be a little slower. Now, if it's really, really slow and it's taking a long time to load up things, then you've probably forgot to enable virtualization in your BIOS. Very important, you get into your BIOS and definitely change that uh, because you're going to have a hard time in WSL, and hypervisors, even VirtualBox. All of it relies on that hypervisor uh, there. So let's just set all this up, no swap. And we're going to use the whole thing. So let's just change that. And we'll log in automatically and use the same password because we're super secure. And we'll hit install. 
And this is going to install it. A lot of people have a lot of issues with resolution too, with this. There's a couple, two different ways you can do resolution with your machine. Uh, the first way is if you did a Gen 2, you can just do it with PowerShell. It makes it super easy. The second way is to do it through Grub in your actual uh, system here. Now, there's uh, a way we can just edit it directly from here. Uh, I'll show you once we get in the first way, which is universal. You can do it on Gen 1, Gen 2 machines and set your resolution, uh, but it won't dynamically set it because there is no guest tool, so to speak, that uh, many other places like VMware has, also VirtualBox has them. All right, and there we go. The whole process took about four minutes for the install, three to four minutes. Uh, that was a full-blown KDE install, mind you, too. So that's a really fast equivalent to what you'd experience on bare metal. This was also a splint, spinning platter, not an NVMe drive. If I did an NVMe drive, I bet I could have got this down to about two minutes. <laughs> so that's how fast this hypervisor is. I just wanted to show that full install. Now it's going to reboot, and you'll notice right away this resolution, if we zoom out here, is pretty darn small. Uh, so obviously we need to fix the resolution. We're going to do it first with what's called the Hyper-V frame buffer. And we're going to change that uh, because that's a universal way of doing it. But we can get even better than that. All right, we're on our desktop here. And just to kind of showcase, uh, we'll do what? Uh, I think it's Alt and Space. And then let's go into the Settings menu. And you'll notice right out of the gate, it's like a little bit laggy, not really showing quite quite what we want. It's not that bad though, but we'll optimize it a little bit further. Um, let's come into display because this is the first thing you're going to want to do and where people get lost on Hyper-V. They'll come into here and then they're like, okay, I'm going to change it to 1080p, hit apply, and then usually that doesn't work. So I guess Manjaro did some, some changes to their thing to where they're able to virtualize this a little bit better. I'm actually impressed. Most Linux things You'd have to actually come into, uh, let's let's just launch our terminal real fast. And I believe that's console and KDE. And we'll come into here. I'm, it's been a little bit since I've done Manjaro. And I got to say, I'm kind of impressed. Let's see what we can do here. Now, obviously, 1080p was where it maxed out. But we, I'm on a 1440p monitor. So obviously, we need to get that resolution. I'll show you that here in a second. Uh, but the first way you would do it is probably like a sudo vim, and we don't even have vim installed, do we? <laughs> Let's go sudo pacman sy vim. You can use nano for this, or even a text editor if you like. Uh, Kate is actually the text editor that comes with KDE. But any of these text editors will work. So we'll just do a sudo vim etc default and pick grub. All right. From grub here, you can see all the different things that's being added. And what you typically would do is you'd add that Hyper-V frame buffer. Uh, so you would do like a video equals Hyper-V underscore FB for frame buffer colon and then 1920 by 1080. This would force the 1080p resolution every single time you boot into your system. So what you can do here on this line is add on the end video equals Hyper-V underscore frame buffer or FB and then 1920 by 1080 and then you'd save this out. And then you just do a sudo update grub. If you are in uh, Debian, you can do that. Obviously Manjaro already added that alias. Regular Arch, you, you'd have to do the long form of this. And then every time you'd reboot, it would always be in 1080p format. So let's give it a reboot real fast. So here we are back on our desktop in 1080p. Uh, but if we go back into display, just to double check here, we're capped at that 1080p and we want to improve that. So I want to actually first remove that setting I, I did in here. Let's just launch back into our terminal, crease that up. And then we'll just do that sudo vim again and delete that last bit of line. We're just going to remove that video hyper v fb for frame buffer. And then we'll just do a sudo update grub again. And that'll basically remove that customization. I wanted to show that's the first way of changing the resolution and hard coding it uh, to your, your VM.
The second way though, let's go ahead, shut it down. I already showed you we only have 1080p resolution. And what we'll do here is I have in my little script section, if we come back into my little GitHub, I think VM set resolution, what we're gonna type into PowerShell. Now, if you're looking for this on the web, it, you can see it right in the GitHub for the Windows 10 script. You go to Hyper-V Tools, set resolution is right here. You can grab it right there or just grab it, the raw file directly if you like, if you wanna rerun this multiple times. Obviously change it to your resolution of choice. Mine right here is 2560 by 1440, uh, which is a bit excessive. And then we need to change the Ubuntu 2004 to the actual name of our VM. So if we look at our VM, it is just called Manjaro with a capital M. Uh, case does matter in PowerShell. So we'll go PowerShell with admin and we'll paste that in there and come back in and change Manjaro. All right, and that's done. We'll connect that, start it up. And then when this starts up, it should uh, adjust to the 1440p. Now let's see if we have to go into display properties to see this properly. Display configurations. And now we got some more options here. Uh, let's see, we should have a 1440p 2560. Now on this one, I guess we don't. That sucks. So there's some further optimizations we need to do since we're not getting the full resolution, but also we're not getting our sound either. You see our, our sound is actually off. Uh, so we need to fix that. And, and some of the performance isn't exactly fantastic. I mean, it's pretty close to what you get on hardware, but uh, we can make it a little bit better. So let's uh, change that. We're gonna grab our script from github.com, Chris Titus Tech. Win 10 script. And uh, I do need to change that to Windows Toolbox, but we're gonna go into my Hyper-V tools. I grabbed this, uh, it's an XR XRDP uh, enhancer tool basically for Arch-based systems. Uh, I changed it up a little bit. This was actually originally designed for Microsoft before they moved on to WSL. Uh, but there's also another one I have for Debian-based system, that's Ubuntu and a lot of other ones and it was made by this guy right here griffin and it's extremely extremely good but i don't think any of it was written with arch in mind so pop os ubuntu debian all of those you can run his script for that and i actually put that just a copy of his latest version in there uh, but left all of his headers and comments in there so you know who to give credit for so on this one though this is the one we need we're going to want to grab this and run it this is gonna install a couple different things. Xorg RDP, make this display a little bit better. Uh, enhance the RDP session that we're in right now. That's all it is, is that it's running on the bare hardware and we're just seeing like a remote window of it. And we need to enhance that. So this modifies Linux on here, the guest, to basically make it a lot faster. And then, uh, yeah. Do, do some stuff for our sound as well. I, I don't know if I've added the sound to this just yet. We might have to add that uh, later on. I'll enhance the script a bit. But for today, we'll go ahead and launch into our terminal. And it's still considerably better than what you you normally would get. And we're just gonna do a wget of it. And I'll enhance that up for you guys so you can see that. Uh, and then we'll just do a ch chmod plus X arch, and we're gonna go pseudo arch. Now, if you do the Debian version uh, from that other person, they, they don't require elevation. I'll probably change this around so we don't need to use pseudo, but uh, for now, we're gonna use pseudo and uh, update this entire package. So I'm gonna let this run. This is a rather large update uh, for the download as it's uh, uploading and updating the entire system and also adding RDP in a, quite a few other uh, settings to enhance our experience. Alrighty, I rebooted here and pretty much all the RDP tools are now installed. So I adjusted the scale up a little bit. Uh, the full screen, I think it's actually something with KDE as a rebooted and it did take up the whole screen. And then as soon as it hit the desktop, it reverted to over. So for whatever reason, it's not detecting every resolution uh, above 1080p, but it does detect a few resolutions above 1080p. 
I'll do some more research on that. It might be just an arch thing as when I was over in the Ubuntu instance, if we launch into it, let's see, I think I have enough memory to launch both. Let's see what this looks like with uh, two machines running now. Uh, but I'm curious. <clears throat> let's, let's boot into Ubuntu as well. And you can see, yeah, it, it definitely takes up the full screen uh, just by issuing that one PowerShell command. So probably a, um, a kernel or maybe it's an HWE driver, some other stuff there. But yeah, this this does take up everything. So I'll, I'll troubleshoot this a little further. But for today's video, I just kind of wanted to show these instances of using Hyper-V as it is pretty much like being in the system you have great virtualization options in Windows, and you're not out of a whole bunch of money. I still much prefer the VMware version. I know it's like, I think three or $400 for the manager uh, or workstation, but it, it's pretty much worth it if you're doing a lot of virtualization in Windows or just use Linux with QEMU. I still prefer that option better than Hyper-V. But I would say for those that really want good performance on their virtual machines and they don't wanna pay any money, and you already have a Windows 10 Pro license, Hyper-V is an option. Uh, I'd still hate how clunky it is and the fact that they just aren't showing it any love and some features have even been removed from it. It used to be very easy to share your GPU, but still a lot of cool things we can do with it. So if you like this video, please let me know down below and thank you to all ChrisTice.com members and members here on YouTube that help support me do what I do. So with that, I'll see you in the next one.